Hello, welcome to this lecture for Education and Usable Security and Privacy. This meets the first learning objective for this module, which is to understand foundational knowledge in security education. Education for security and privacy has three goals, which we can kind of put into a before state and after state. Before people actually can put practices into action, they need awareness and knowledge of two things, of security and privacy risks and security privacy behaviors. Once they've acquired that awareness and knowledge, they also need knowledge, but especially ability um, to put those behaviors into practice. And for that, they need skills and they also need the affordances for those practices. We use many modes of education. So training materials can work very well, web pages, documents, videos that like this, that people can browse on their own time. Awareness campaigns can also be critical and that could take the form of emails, posts, but also posters in the physical environment. Software prompts and dialogues provide a lot of awareness as do news and media articles. Games and activities are a fun, engaging way to have people enact some of these skills and practices that we want them to acquire. And also, of course, conversations. People who know a lot about security and privacy do a great service for the people they know when they share that knowledge with them. And finally, shareable graphics and memes actually can be very effective. This is one about social media cybersecurity, for instance, that I found on Pinterest. Then, of course, we have to consider what we teach people. And let me explain why this is challenging. So we have to teach about security and privacy risks of certain behaviors or issues that exist. And we know that we should use principles of risk communication. We talked about this in the warnings module. We also need to teach people about um, certain experiences of security and privacy risks and problems. And we need to teach them the protective actions they can take when they have those experiences, such as if you get a phishing message on your mobile phone, what are the types of things you should do, such as not to reply, because that can initiate the scammer's full intention to engage you with some sort of trickery. Other things that we want to tell people not to do, such as don't click on links and emails, use antivirus, especially if they have a PC, and to be careful what you share on social media are the types of things they should know before they get put in those situations. All of these protective actions and the advice we give people should be effective, consistent, we wanna be consistent, actionable, and also concise. The challenge can, can be, for instance, users are not and should not be motivated to learn about security. This is only something that really should be a central concern of experts. Other people should be allowed and expected to go about their lives. It's also difficult to teach people to make the right decision without increasing what we would call their false positives. And so that's when they think something is a security risk, but it's not. And I'd say in my research, a lot of text messages that people get now they simply default to thinking everything's a scam. A lot of times that is a false positive. We should make use of learning sciences principles wherever we can. So we know some of the best practices for teaching, for instance, are that we interleave conceptual and procedural information. We put learning into context and we reinforce what is learned. We build in reflection exercises we give immediate feedback, and we provide learning by doing. In this class, for instance, we use the principles of active learning. Gamification can help, as can scaffolding social learning. Now, I put asterisk by two concepts that we already talked about in the phishing module and in the course overview. There's a game called Anti-Fishing Phil. There's also a version called Anti-Fishing Phyllis that uses this conceptual procedural interleaving of concepts along with gamification. It tests people's knowledge of emails 
And there are certain cues in the emails that you're supposed to either identify as the hooks for the fish, or maybe also they are legitimate or something that should not be suspicious. Two studies evaluated these games. One was a lab study, and they found that all training that they did decreased the false negatives. In other words, they helped people uniformly spot phishing sites. When they did it as a game, it was better with the false positives. However, using a game function for this type of intervention, fewer people mistook a legitimate site for phishing. And they also found that the game was better than any other kind of content at teaching techniques to use and not just increasing people's attention. In a large scale study, they found that this game had the most improvements for people who were novices or maybe had intermediate knowledge. The game definitely sped up their decision making. Another study of a fishing intervention is called the Fish Guru. In this study, they used cartoons and humor and wanted to see if that was more effective than more straightforward training. Several studies evaluated these um, interventions. In lab studies, they did find that the comet condition showed the most improvement. And also the idea of doing a so-called embedded training, where say maybe the comic is put inside other materials, performs better over the non-embedded trainings. Now in a real world deployment, they found of course that as, unfortunately a substantial percentage of people fell for simulated phishing attacks. But they found also that training was successful. There was no loss of retention over a month in the skills and knowledge. They also found that multiple training in the study they did it twice was better than single. And also many reported appreciating the training which is also nice. We want to have user satisfaction with education, just like we do with interfaces. Other studies have found there's a lot of ad hoc or informal security learning, and this occurs in specific contexts. For instance, one study asked people in a survey of 526 users where they learned about security information. And for instance, you see in this chart, a lot of people mentioned family and friends, but also their service providers, their work. Maybe they had a negative experience. They learned from school. There was some sort of prompt that, that gave them some information, or maybe it was automatic or they were forced to learn about it. This study unfortunately showed evidence of a digital divide. In other words, more information tends to find you if you have higher skill levels to begin with and higher socioeconomic status. And stories from media and peers is an example of what I've referred to as social learning. In many studies, we found that people actually learn about security information from, of course, formal training, but also articles, web pages or information, and stories from their family and friends. And these types of stories often contain lessons learned from someone else facing a threat. And that was shown to be likely to lead to security behavior change. And moreover, people retell these stories. They have an amplification effect. In my work, I've tried to diagram these processes of how social learning pushes us to act and then to keep acting. Starting with step one, on the left side, threat awareness. We might be influenced by actual threats, of course, but also warnings, alerts, media, and storytelling. And then because we need to respond to those threats, we continue learning. We seek advice and also social proof in which we look around to kind of observe what we should be doing in a given situation can have a powerful effect. At that point, we need to decide whether to adopt a particular practice that we've learned about. We'll implement it, but we probably need troubleshooting help. And unfortunately, sometimes we do need to mandate some of these practices. But what we want to get people to is step four on the right side, the maintenance of the practice. And it's gratifying to see in my research and other research that people in this stage tend to show leadership and to also show caretaking behaviors, such as acting as tech helpers for their family and friends. 
Some research cautions us that education mode and source must be a good match. A 2018 paper, for instance, compared different types of fishing training with four conditions. Did it come as formal facts or advice? As an informal story? Was it delivered by an expert? Or was it delivered by a peer? This study found that facts and advice worked best if delivered by an expert. However, stories worked best if delivered by a peer. Also, a study of how people reacted to the Equifax data breach shows that information might not lead to action. In the study, the vast majority were aware of the breach and of the risks of the breach. In other words, the notifications from the company worked to make people aware of the threat. Then a smaller percentage, 41%, checked whether there was something they could do or whether other words they were impacted. However, only a minority reported freezing their credit or using identity theft measures, which were recommended in the wake of this severe data breach. So why not act? Some of these people had an optimism bias. They also showed a big fish mental model. We refer to this mental model as this idea that you're not enough big enough fish to actually want to attack. In other words, maybe you don't have enough of value for a scammer to want to try to get access to. What I thought was interesting too though in this study is of the people who did act, they were acting on advice from trusted experts and also some family members. Interestingly, not from the media. And another factor in the study that was discovered was that the data breach notifications actually showed us what not to do. They had poor readability. They were lacking in visual emphasis. They had many recommendations, but didn't prioritize them. And honestly, they did downplay the risks. So to sum up from this mini lecture, a common solution to usable security and privacy issues is to better educate users. In earlier lectures, I talked about this as one of the three prongs of what we can do with making it invisible and providing better user affordances. Now, education can work, but it has its limits. It has challenges such as getting people to pay attention, accurately conveying risks, prioritizing what people should do since they can't do everything, and motivating people to take protective actions. Thank you for listening. I'll see you in class.